I would like us to pray and then we shall hear the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We recognize that you are our Lord and that, Lord, we are the sheep of your pastor. We thank you for your awesome presence in this house. And we thank you, Lord, for the word that we're just about to read this morning. We pray that this will be our word. It will challenge us. It will stretch us. It will bless us. And this word shall inspire us to be the people that, Lord, you've called us to be. Pray your blessing over this family. We thank you for all they have done for the nations of the world. I pray for each one of them, specifically that, Lord, you bless them that, Lord, you bless their families, and that, Lord, you bless this church corporately for what they have done for the nations of God. We thank you for your love, and as we hear this word of God, give us hearing ears and believing hearts that, Lord, as we hear this word, it shall be the word that will bless our lives today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to open our Bibles in the book of uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 13. Pass number one, number two, number three, and pass uh, one, two, and three, and uh, we shall be blessed. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, pass number one, number two, and three. The Bible says this. Uh, are we all there? Now there was in the church at Antioch prophets, uh, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, uh, Simon, are we there? Then there was Simon, uh, who was called Niger, Lucius, who was from Cyrene, Manaim, who was a friend of uh, Herod, etc. And while they were Worshipping and fasting, the Holy Spirit is said, Set aside for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have I called them. Then, after fasting and praying, he laid their hands on them and sent them off. I'll say that again. And after praying and fasting, they laid their hands on them and send them off. Uh, I want to talk about something that will encourage you as a church. Uh, having heard from your pastor and looking at that, uh, that wall, something that is going to encourage you to even continue to do what you've been doing for the Lord. I want to talk about the four characteristics of the Antioch church. And I will read this chart with the church that was in Jerusalem, and you'll see how different these two local churches were. Uh, one of them was focused outward. The other church was focused inward. And so the scripture says uh, that in the church at Antioch, and this was a church that had been planted in the Gentile world, the scripture says that in that church, uh, we had two, two different faculties. There were prophets, and then there were also teachers in that church. And as you look at the names of the people who were given there, that church looked like this church. Because, uh, you know, Paul came from Tarsus. Barnabas came from Cyprus. Simon of Lucius came from Africa. He came from Libya. Then there was another guy who was raised by Herod the Tetrarch. So all these guys did not come from one region. They did not come from one culture. They did not come from one country. They came from different places. But they were all part of the same local assembly. They were all part of the same church. And sharing this scripture should encourage you because when I look at this church and the size of this church and the nations that you have touched and the nations that are you know, represented here, I think this church was like the Antioch church in the Bible. And the scripture says that uh, as, the, you know, as they were praying, as they were worshiping the Lord and also fasting, they created an environment for the Holy Spirit to work both in them and through them. 
And the scripture says that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is said, set aside for me Paul and Barnabas for the work which I have called them uh, to do. The first point that I would like to say is uh, the angel church, when you look at their characteristics, and every church has different characteristics. When you look at the church in Jerusalem, which was the mother church, and you compare this church that was planted in the general world, the church in Antioch, you discover that they had different characteristics. And there is something that we can always learn from the church in Antioch. The first point is that the Antioch church was a mission-oriented church. And I say this to mean this. this. This was a very missional church like this church because they believed that uh, they had a mission to the world. And the scripture says that uh, wh- when they were, while they were praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit of God, he spoke in the midst and he said, separate for me Barnabas uh, and Saul for the work which I have called them. And the Bible says that after praying for them, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. That word sending off means and they casted them out into the mission field. So that Barnabas and Paul or Saul as he was known then, they could go out and preach the gospel and they planted churches and Paul raised many sons and this became the church that sent them out. So as you think about this church here, you are thinking ab- about a church uh, whose heart was aligned to the missionary heart of God. Because when you study the scriptures from the very beginning, you see that God is, oh, God is heart is always, always going out towards men to bring him back to himself. Right from the time that Adam and Eve sinned in, in the Garden of Eden, you know, God had to kill an innocent animal uh, so that he could cover the nakedness of Adam and his wife, Eve. And from that day, the heart of God has always been to bring man back to himself. So this church here was just like this church because uh, they were aligned to the mission of the heart of God and their hearts were always beating in tune with the heart of God. It was like, how can I bring this man to myself? And uh, I would like to say this, my friends. As you think about this church, you know, they came together, they laid hands on Paul, and they lay hands on, uh, on Barnabas as a symbol of uh, blessing and commissioning. That's what laying hands, laying hands of, of hands was. When people were being sent out or commissioned to go to the mission field as missionaries, you know, when you lay hands on someone, it's like you are saying, my brother or my sister, I have your back. I'm laying my hands on you to identify with you and your mission. And as you go out there, it's good to know that you are not alone. We as the sending church, we will stand together with you. That's what they laid their hands on these two apostles, and they sent them out. And so we can say the Antioch church was a sending church. When you look at the church in Jerusalem, you know, after they gained a few thousand, uh, you know, members because of uh, the preaching of Peter and other great apostles of the Lamb, they had several people, their concentration was uh, around Jerusalem. They were not willing to do what we call a cross-cultural mission because they focused so much in and within and around Jerusalem. And from the time the church was planted, the church started in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, up to Acts chapter number 7, the concentration of the believers in the church in Jerusalem was just around at Jerusalem to the Jewish people. And Jesus, before he left, he told his disciples that go to all the nations of the world and make what? The, make, make disciples. But for the first few years, the mother church, the Jerusalem church, their focus was inside, inward, in Jerusalem to the Jewish people. And they spent a lot of time. God looked at these guys from heaven and he said, well, you are doing a great work, but that is not all that I called you to do. And he had to send something to get this church out of their comfortable nest. Amen? And many times, uh, we love our comfortable nest. We don't want to get out there. We don't want to pay the price. 
We don't want to pay the, the, the cost to get out. We are like, I like it here. It's cooler. I have my brothers here. I have relationships here. I don't want to get out of this place. And God said, you know, I believe God in heaven said, it's not about your comfort. It's not about what you want. My will is, this gospel has to be taken out. And in, in chapter number 8 of the book of Acts, the Bible says that uh, now there was great persecution that came to the church in Jerusalem. And the scripture says that uh, all the disciples, the disciples, the thousands of them, maybe hundreds of them, the scripture says because Stephen had been killed and uh, James had been killed and the great persecution arose on that day. And the Bible says that uh, the disciples uh, fled from, uh, from Jerusalem and they went to Judea and they went to Samaria, now fulfilling the word of God, except the apostles. And every place where they went, they were sharing the word of God, fulfilling what Jesus had wanted the church to do from the very beginning. But when you look at the church in, uh, in Antioch, this church did not need persecution. All right? To get out. They were already getting out like this church here. This church does not need persecution, by the way. <laughs> Because I think about the 54 missionaries that you are supporting in different parts of the world, you are already a very missionary-oriented church. But the church in Jerusalem, they needed something to keep them out, to get them out of their comfort zones. And when the persecution came, well, there was crying in Jerusalem, but I'm sure there was rejoicing in heaven. Amen? There was pain in Jerusalem, but there was rejoicing where? In heaven. Because at least the people that God wanted, the, the sheep that were lost, that the Father wanted to bring in, these people at least were coming in because uh, the disciples, who are not the original apostles, they were going out to the street corners, to the villages, to the Samaritan homes and towns, and they were preaching the word of God, and people were coming to the Lord uh, because of uh, their sharing of their faith. Therefore, as my first point, I would like to say that uh, the Antioch church, like we can see uh, from the book of Acts chapter 13, verse number, number 2, this was a very missional, a very missions-oriented church because they believed in missions and they sent out missionaries and they supported missions who went out to the mission field to do the work that God had called them to do. And as a church, I want to encourage you, my friend. I've been in so many churches, and at times you get so disappointed. There are several churches that are focused inward. They have mega buildings. They have fancy things. And I've gone to a church that could sit like maybe a thousand people. You will only see like 50 people inside. And then you wonder all the money that was spent on, a, on the buildings and all the things, if it was given out to the nations, this money will help to bring so many people to the kingdom. And uh, when I walk, we walked in here yesterday, and Pastor was sharing the story of uh, uh, what you guys have done over the years. Then I looked at the size of this church building, and then I was looking forward to meeting you guys. And, uh, you know, today I'm now looking at the people who are making it to happen in different nations. People who sacrificially give, and because your focus is outward, I want to tell you something. Maybe you are not feeding thousands of people here, but I want to tell you this. Your reward in heaven is great. And you are making a huge difference in a bigger part of the world. Amen? So Antioch was a very missions-oriented church. And this church, I believe, is also a very missions-oriented church. And thank you for praying for the nations. Thank you for sending missionaries from this church. Thank you for supporting missionaries who are already doing God's work out there because there are several ways that uh, we can all be involved in the missionary work. There are people like Brother Larry who have decided to go. There are others who might not be able to go because of many reasons, but you can pray, but you can give, but you can even encourage. You can just become a friend of Larry. Sometimes in life I was feeling friends in another church that sometimes in life all you need is a friend who will hug you and tell you, I love you. Sometimes that is all you need in, in life. Has someone ever told you that they love you? Like if my wife looked at me in the eyes and she said, Sweetie, I love you. Then I look at her and say, Baby, I love you. And at times we'll, uh, I'll hug her and then at times we'll cry. Just that to know that someone out there, you know, someone can be your wife, but they don't, don't love you, right? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> But at times you need that assurance, right? 
We've been married for 20 years, and uh, if, if she tells you that she still loves you after 20 years, you're like, mm, Jesus, you're good. <laughs> so, the Antioch Church was involved in cross-cultural missions work, and they were very mission-oriented church as my first point. And I want to say that uh, to encourage your friends that you as a church, you've been a very mission-oriented church. Number two, the Antioch Church was uh, a worship-oriented center. Worship-oriented center. Or you can say a worship-oriented family. The scripture says that uh, while they were worshiping God, while they were worshiping God, and, uh, you know, I would like to explain something here. You know, many times we, we, we praise the Lord, and sometimes we worship the Lord. We praise God because of the things that He has done for us. We praise the Lord for the things that He is doing for us. And we praise the Lord by faith for the things that He will do for us in the days to come. But we worship the Lord not because we want anything from Him. We worship God or we, we give reverence to the Lord for who He is to us. And, uh, you know, you recognize that, hey, I am a sheep and Jesus is my shepherd. And you go before Him and say, Father, I want to thank you this morning. I come before your presence, not to ask you for money or for food or for anything, but I'm coming in your presence just to love you because of who you are in my life. And the fact that He has saved you and He has called you and He's brought you into the sheepfold and He's made you to be a sheep uh, in the sheepfold in itself is a great blessing. Therefore, we worship God not because of uh, uh, we want something from Him, but we worship the Lord because of uh, we respond to His love and we worship Him because of, uh, he, of, of who He is to us. And that's the reason why we give reference to Him. And as we worship the Lord as the church, as we worship the Lord as the people called by His name, as the sheep of His pasture, then we create an environment where the Holy Spirit of the Father can come and dwell among us and also minister to us. And therefore, this church was a very worship-oriented church. And I would like to appreciate the worship team this morning. My wife leads worship, and in, in it, many times when I go to the worship service, I can't just help it because, you know, I've been around her for 20 years, and she's a worship leader in our church, and many times during the worship service, I can't just help it but to release myself. Many times there's just no way I can do that because, you know, I think about uh, who God is, and I think about my life, and I think about where I will be today. I come from a family of 36 children. My mother had 14 children. I'm number seven. And we were all Catholics in that family. And uh, today, all our brothers and sisters, 13 of us, they're all born again. And uh, we, have, uh, we have three pastors in our family. And uh, several of my sisters are married to pastors. And we meet once in a year. Larry has come to speak in our family meeting once. When we meet, normally we are a hundred and something people. <laughs> so when we come, and I'm the pastor of the family, and so I always bring the word of God every year to over 100 family members of my father. And so what happens is that when I became a Christian, I remember, uh, you know, I was the first person to become a Christian. I was persecuted by the family. My father threw me out. He threatened me. He refused even to pay my high school fees, and I suffered for one year. And, uh, you know, he told me that he would disown me before the father because I've, I'm lost, I'm confused. And, uh, you know, after, you know, I came back home, I stayed with my father after my mom passed on. And uh, I was the one cooking for him and washing his clothes for more than three years. And just before he died at age 76, my father called me one, one time and, uh, you know, he watched me live the Christian life before him. And he discovered that I was not confused and lost the way he thought. And uh, when he died, you know, having had 36 children, he did not have any money in the bank to live with us. He had zero. The only thing he left with us was 10 acres of land and eucalyptus trees that he left with us. So he called me. He said, you bring your hand over here. I, I took my hand. And my father speed in my, 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 my right hand and he said, my son. I don't have any money to give to you, 
but I'm blessing you to preach the gospel to all the nations of the world. <laughs> so, you know, that is the only blessing I received from my father before he, he died. I was little by then when he said that. And uh, of course, but my father was married to three wives at the same time. So, and, and all the three mothers lived in the same house. This was uh, wife number one was here, wife number two was there, and wife number three was, was there. And we had a common room where we all ate together. And, the, the, and he came up, you know, our mothers came up with a very simple policy. And they said, you know, this is a big family. And they said, the, the principle is, is survival for the fetus. So when the bell rings for, when they call for, for dinner, you need to go for dinner. If you delay, <laughs> because if you delayed, these guys will eat all the food and you'll go there and there'll be no food to eat. And so we grew up knowing that, hey, you have to fight your way. Therefore, I think about the greatness of God. I think about our family. And I think about what God has done in that Roman Catholic family. How the Lord has changed things in our family. And many times I have nothing to say, but I go before the Lord and say, Father, I worship you for who you are. Because if it's not for your saving grace, if it's not for your mighty hand, if it was not for your power, George will be a dead man and our family will, not, will still be lost on their way to hell. But thanks be to the Lord because of his grace. So the Antioch church was a very worship-oriented what? church. They loved the Lord and worshipped the Lord for who God was in their lives. Number three. Uh, number, the third point I would like to say is that uh, Antioch church, the, 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 this church here, as we look at it, the, you know, it was a church that delighted in a prayer and fasting. You know, I wanted to raise uh, my hand when Pastor was talking about people wanted to pray in January. But being a guest, I said, maybe I'll go to Pastor silently. I would like to join you guys in Kenya praying during that week because uh, we believe in prayer and fasting. And therefore, uh, you know, I will be in Kenya then because I fly back on Wednesday. But I would like to join with you. We'll be praying together as you pray. We shall also be praying from the other side. So the Antioch Church, the, the scripture says, this, the members in this church, they delighted in prayer and fasting. The scripture says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting at the church. And friends, I want to say this. One person said that the prayer is the life and the strength of a church. Prayer is the life and the strength of a church. If we want the Lord to use us as a church, I know this is a very praying church. I want to tell you something. I've gone to churches whereby they have so many good programs. But one of the things that is missing on their program is prayer and fasting. You will never hear them talk about praying and fasting. And uh, it's no wonder when you go to those places, the programs are great. But in those programs, sometimes you don't feel the presence of God. Let me tell you this, my friend. This is what these people are doing. You know, the scriptures, one person said, the problem that uh, we're having with the current church is that people want to go out and minister to the world before they minister to God. But the thing with this church was this. The Antioch church, they ministered to the Lord in prayer and in fasting. And after ministering to the Lord, the Lord ministered to them through the Holy Spirit. And after God, the Holy Spirit ministering to them, they went out and ministered to the world. So in essence, there was ministry to God, and then there was a God's ministry to them, and then there was the ministry to the world. And because of that, we can see this was a very successful church. And I want to tell you this, my friends. This was the approach of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. If you read the book of Mark, Chapter 1, verse number 35. Before Jesus ever, and then you read John chapter 5, verse number 19, when you tie those scriptures together, you will agree with what I'm saying. Before Jesus went out to preach to the multitude, either to heal them, to cast demonic spirits, or even to feed the hungry, the scripture says in Mark chapter 1, verse number 35, that while it was, he woke up, you know, while it was still very early in the morning, he woke up and he went to a lonely place to pray. While it was still very early, everybody was sleeping, everybody was still having a good time. Jesus woke up 
and he sneaked away from the disciples, he went somewhere into the presence of the Father to pray. And after praying, he came out knowing exactly what the Father wanted him to do. Because if you read John, uh, John 5.19, Jesus said that the Son can do nothing except what he sees the Father doing. And the Son can say nothing unless he, hears what, unless he says exactly what he has the Father saying. Which means during that prayer time in the morning when Jesus was ministering to the Father, the Father was able to minister to him. So when he woke up from that prayer closet, Jesus knew that there is five people that my Father is, uh, wants to heal somewhere in Fresno. There is a dead person that my Father wants me to raise somewhere. And he cooperated with his Heavenly Father in uh, making those miracles happen. Therefore, the success of Jesus' ministry was attributed to the fact that before he ministered to the people, he ministered to the Father. And the Father ministered to him, and therefore, out of that ministry, he ministered to the world. And so, when I heard you guys talking about the prayer and fasting for 21 days, to minister to the Father so that God can minister to us in 2023, and as he ministers to, minister to us, then you can minister to the Father. 54 missionaries were out there. What a blessing that will be. Sometimes I've seen people struggle casting out demonic spirits or praying for the people. The reason is uh, if you ask them or you stay close to them, you realize that they spend so much time with the people and very little time with the Lord. And because of that, they are very ineffective in their ministry. But Jesus didn't waste a lot of time with the demons, by the way. Sometimes even his presence alone in a place, his shadow will cause the demons to say, Jesus, thou son of God, have you come to destroy us before our time? This is way before he opened up uh, his mouth to say anything. Because he spent a lot of time in the presence of the Father. And once he showed up in a place, the demons were very uncomfortable. Amen? The demons were very uncomfortable. You remember the story of the young boy that was brought to Jesus Christ, to the disciples, and the disciples were not able to, to, to heal that, that boy. And, uh, you know, when Jesus came, uh, you know, came on the scene, you know, the mother uh, brought this boy and they said, Here, I brought this, uh, this, my boy, my son, to the disciples, and they were not able to cast the spirit out and cure him. And, uh, you know, you know what Jesus did? Jesus didn't struggle, he didn't sweat, he didn't yell or anything like that. He just commanded the spirit to leave this boy and the, to the amazement of the disciples. And then uh, you know, I, I think the disciples were embarrassed. And then later on, after all was said and done, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Master, can you tell us? It was so easy for you to heal this boy. And we tried the whole week and the, the, the whole day and many hours. We shouted, nothing happened. And then Jesus said, such cannot come out unless it's by prayer and fasting. And therefore, Jesus, because he was praying and is fasting and seeking the Father, it was very easy for him to show up. And, uh, and you know, you know it, was, it was easy for him to show up and heal this guy because uh, he had taken time to minister to the Father. The Father had ministered to him. It was very easy for him to minister to the sick body. Amen? So the Antioch church, they delighted in prayer and in fasting. And I want to encourage you, my friends, as you plan to start off the year with prayer and fasting, that is the key to having an effective ministry to the world. I know there is so much that is going on in Kenya. There is so much that is going on in Uganda. There is so much that is going on in the United States. There are so many forces of hell that, you know, are directed against the church. And the only way we can be effective in ministering to our nations, to our government, to our schools and the societies, is when we spend time to minister to the Lord in prayer and in fasting. And we just allow Him to minister to us. And God will give you direction on what He wants you to say and how He wants you to say it. He will direct you to the people that He wants you to go to. And when you do that, you'll have a very successful ministry. Amen? Amen. That is why sometimes, at times you've gone to, you've gone to a place where you see that, you know, you know, Jesus did not just pray for everybody. Like he went to his hometown, and the scripture says that, uh, you know, he laid hands on a few people and he healed them, and he was amazed by their unbelief. 
which means as he was praying to the father, the father told him, out of a thousand sick people, you'll only heal five. <laughs> and so Jesus went under the direction of his father. He laid hands on just us. He did not try to lay hands on every sick person in his hometown because maybe they will not have been healed. But because of his ministry to the father, the father was able to guide him on what to say. And those that he laid hands on, they were surely healed. Amen? So ministry to God, and then God will minister to us, and then we can go out to minister to the world. Don't try to change it. Don't minister to the world and then go and minister to God. If you change the way those, those things work, then you will get into problems. So Antioch was a very prayerful church. The last point I would like to say is that Antioch church was a, a very united church. It was a very united church. I talked about all these names here. Uh, this was a multiracial church. It was a multicultural church. They did not have any problem, uh, you know, with, they, they didn't have, uh, you know, maybe I would like to say this. This was an example of a church without walls. Amen? Because there is one guy from Libya, his name was called Simon Lucius. He found his way in this church. Then there was this guy from, uh, from Tarsus. His name was called Saul. He had a very bad background as a murderer. He was part of the church. Then there was this guy from, uh, from Cyprus. His name is called Barnabas. He was on the faculty. And then there was this other guy who was called Simon, raised from the Tetrarch, friend of uh, Tetrarch Herod. He was part of the, uh, he was also on the faculty. So as you look at all these guys here, they came from different cultures, different backgrounds, different nations, but they were all part of the same church. And as I look at this church, you are not a thousand people, but I can, there are several people here who come from different, uh, who come from different, uh, different nations and different cultures. And one of the things that has blessed me about this church, I was talking to Brother Larry and Pastor, is this is one of the churches that I've walked in that is filled with the joy of the Lord and there is the, the family spirit that works in this church. People take time to greet one another, to hug one another. People are interested in one another. I've gone to churches where it's very mechanical. You switch on and switch off. You get into the church. Sit in your chair, finish the service, get in your car, go back home, or in your bike, can get back home. It's very mechanical, and uh, it seems like uh, people are connected to, to Jesus Christ, but they are not connected to one another. But I believe that what God does is that uh, when Jesus saves us, He joins us to the heart of the Father, and the Father wants to join us to one another. So that we can live together in community as people who have been called together and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Antioch church was a church without walls. There were no racial or tribal walls in the church. In Kenya, we have 42 tribes, and we have a problem with tribalism. Even when we have our elections, our elections are always, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we vote tribally because, you know, every, 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 every tribe wants to volunteer a person to become the president. And if the person does not win the election, then other tribes will be like, mm, he's not of my tribe and I don't support him and things like that. And because of that, we've had a very serious problem with tribalism in this country, in our country, in, in, in Kenya today. But uh, as the church continues to proclaim the gospel, you know, we have people who come from different tribes and uh, different groups and they come together in the same church and they begin to worship together. Those tribal walls begin to break down. When you come to our school, KMTI, uh, I'm a lawyer and uh, I speak seven languages. But when we, when we come to our school, we have a, it's a small school with a small staff, but maybe we have more than seven different tribes. And therefore, our national language, our school language is not my dialect. We speak in English and Swahili. Because, uh, and when people come there, they are surprised because they see a lawyer. And then they will see a Kalenjin, then they will see a Trukana, then they will see a Tess, maybe all these kinds of people. And then they ask us, uh, you know, is your school, uh, what is the affiliation of your school? Is it affiliated to Luya or Kalenjin or is it affiliated to him? No, we are in the denomination of Bible institution. And because we believe in the Bible, we want to show you that different tribes can work together in Christ and they can be brothers and sisters in Christ. So this church here, 
the people in this church, they were very, very united, and uh, they worked together. And uh, one of the things that uh, the enemy has tried to do over the years to weaken the church is to cause divisions in the church. And uh, let me tell you this something. I've been a pastor for 25 years, and let me tell you something. Uh, one of the things that has been destroying and killing the church more dangerously than even cancer is what we call strife and contention. When there is strife and contention in the church, Every, the enemy will take this good brother and take this good brother on this side. He will set them against each other, and then they will begin biting into each other. They are in the same church, in the same family, but these are two people moving two different directions. And when the enemy succeeds to do that, then he will weaken the church. But if we allow the Lord to unite the church together so that the church can speak one voice, so that the church can fight like one soldier. So that the church can go one direction. That is the direction of God. So that the church can have one mission and one purpose. When pastor says we are going to do this, we say, we are behind you, pastor. Let us get it done. The church might be small, but I want to tell you something. There is power in unity. The, you know, I've, I've seen sometimes, uh, very, I've seen people who are united. They might be fewer in number. But look at the things that they do. Uh, you know, a thousand people cannot be able to do it. And if you want to know that there is power in unity, just read the book of Genesis, chapter number 11. Read verse number 6. It's the story of uh, the Tower of Babel. The scripture says that uh, during that time, uh, you, know, you know, people were of one language. People spoke, they were in one place and they spoke one language. And they decided that uh, we want to build a, we want to build a, a tower uh, so that uh, we can speak and reach God in heaven. And the scripture says uh, that these people, because they were united in purpose and also in mission, they started the work. And what they started to do because they were united, it got the attention of heaven. And uh, God, you know, you know, the Trinity had to do something. You know, God the Father spoke and said, well, uh, look at what is going on on us. The people are of one language. They are working on one project. They have one mission, and the mission is to build the tower. And because of that, what they are planning to do is not impossible, which means it's very possible. And God said, let us go down at once and confuse their tongues. And one of the things that the Lord did was, once he, he confused their tongues so that there was no communication, you know, the work stopped. The mission stopped. The project is stopped. And uh, this one teaches us that, uh, you know, this is God confessing that because the people are speaking one language, they have one mission, they are moving one direction, whatever it is that they plan to do, it, nothing will be impossible. Which means as a church, if we are in one place, we have one mission, we have one purpose, we let our hearts be together, you know, and then we fight like one soldier. We are all in the army, and we are fighting like one soldier. You say, my brother, I have your back. And we are all decided that this is the direction we are going to take. In that unity, you bring your little strength, my little strength. You bring your experience. I bring my experience. I bring my energy. You bring your energy. We put it all together. We become a force. And in Kenya, the church has been so weakened because of uh, strife and contention among different churches. And because of that, we have, you know, there are places where we have even lost favor with the government because one group says this, another group says this. But if the church can be united and we speak one voice, if we are condemning one thing, we say as a church, as the body of Christ. Men, I want to tell you something. There is nothing that God will ordain for us to do that we are not able to do. Because there is power in what? In unity. So the Antioch church was uh, such a, a united church. And at times when we are united, my friend, you might be the youngest, but, you know, because you are part of a team, you are part of a movement, you are part of a force, your little contribution uh, will make a difference because you are part of the group. I come from a country where we have so many mosquitoes. Kenya has so many mosquitoes, by the way. And when those mosquitoes bite you, they don't just come for lunch. No. 
We have a female mosquito called Anopheles mosquito uh, that carries the malaria parasite. And so if you are bitten by the Anopheles mosquito, uh, chances are that you'll, uh, you'll get malaria in a few hours. Then you'll have a headache, you'll have high fever, and then uh, sometimes you can have diarrhea, heart palpitation, and things like that. And if you are not treated, it can be very chronic. And in fact, some of you, when you think about Kenya, you think about lions. And yes, we have so many lions, mean lions that will eat you for lunch. But let me tell you something. Uh, the statistics shows that uh, even if lions are, the lion is the king of the jungle, and the lions are very dangerous if you, you get into, according to the place where they live, they can eat you for lunch. But the statistics shows that uh, there are more people who are killed from malaria. Uh, that is caused by the, anop the bite from the anopheles mosquito than the dangerous lions. Which means, uh, some people say, well, I am young. I'm part of this church, but I don't have much money. Maybe I'm young. Maybe I'm old. Maybe my contribution will be nothing. I always tell people this. If you think that you are too little to make a difference, you come to Kenya, let's put you in a mosquito net, and let's just put like one mosquito inside that, that net. Trust me, that mosquito will be a new thing. Because when they vibrate their, their legs like this, they, they produce a you'll go like and forever you'll be going like, you, you can't just sleep. And this is a tiny little thing that you can just like, and then you can blow him away. But trust me, there are so many people who are in their graves in Kenya, especially young children and pregnant mothers. There are so many that live in the woods that cannot access uh, medication that die every year in thousands because of the mosquito bite. But there is just that you will hear like maybe there's two cases of a, a, a marauding lion maybe mauling someone and eating them. But those mosquitoes that we live with in the house, they just time when we switch off the light, they don't have nee, 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 nee. <laughs> And then uh, if you let them bite you and you don't seek for treatment, you'll get malaria and if you don't get treatment, you will die. And therefore, if you think you are too small and you cannot make a difference, just be a mosquito for Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Just decide and say, well, I'm, I'm not a lion, but I'm just a mosquito. And I'll be a mosquito for Jesus. I'll just go, <laughs> I'll go to this neighbor and all I will do is, <laughs> praise the Lord. So this chat here, so your, your contribution will make a difference. And there is power when we come together. If, like a, if, if I'm a soldier trained and I have all the arsenals with me and I can fight them strong and I'm alone, surely you might be susceptible to some attack. But as we come together, as we join our hands together, we become an army. And in companies, there is what? Protection. And one person said, the strength of a lion, let me just explain something as I'll finish. The lion is the king of the jungle. You have heard something like that before, right? He when the lion roars, like I was in Masai Mara in the month of July, and we went to a place where the lions were eating a, were eating a winter beast. And this lion called it. And you will see the, the winter beast and the zebras that are just like miles away. Their ears will be like standing like this because they think, what, just, uh, what sound was that? They know the king of the jungle has just roared. The lion is not the tallest animal if you come to Kenya in Masai Mara. The giraffe is the tallest of all the animals, okay? And then the lion is not the heaviest of all the, the animals we have in our national park. But, you know, the elephant weighs about, a big one weighs about 6.6 .6 tons. Huge, okay? And then the lion is not even the smartest of all the animals that we have. They always think the buffalo, the buffalo is the smartest of all the animals because... You, if you look at the buffalo, we looked at one buffalo, and the, this guy was guiding us, said, you might think he has closed the eyes and he's sleeping, but there is a way they, you know, they, they, they close their eyes halfway, but they're watching what is going on. So he says, don't think that buffalo is sleeping. He is very attentive to what is going on. Yet the buffalo or the giraffe or the elephant, they are not the kings of the jungle, but the lion is. And one person said, that uh, the secret of the lion being considered the king of the jungle is that the strength of the lion lies in their company. And this is what it means. 
if a lion wants to bring down an, uh, uh, to bring down maybe a buffalo that weighs about 1,200 kilos, that's a heavy animal. That's a lot of meat. They will see this buffalo standing and looking as if he's sleeping, but he's not. And they know there's a male buffalo weighing 1,200 kilos. Then one lion, maybe the lioness, mostly they are the most ferocious, a lioness will come and then will dare this buffalo and then jump on the buffalo. You might think the, the lioness is alone, but in just a few minutes, there will be lions coming from all over to support this lioness to bring down the, the buffalo. So the strength of a lion lies in what? In company. They always hunt together. They always fight together. They always bring their prey down together. And once they bring the prey down together, they always share the spoils together as well. So as a church, uh, you know, I don't want you to think that maybe if we just like separated you from the rest of the people, uh, trust me, you might not be able to do so much. In Kenya, we use uh, a jiko. I don't know how they would say a jiko, but uh, you know, we still use cook using firewood, uh, firewood and, uh, and charcoal. So they'll get the charcoal and put it in, like on a stove or something like that, and then uh, you'll have to... Uh, to find it for a few minutes, and then you'll get uh, one charcoal will catch the fire, and then there will be two, there's three, there's four, there's five, six, and then the whole stove will be filled with fire, and then you can uh, you can cook your ugali or your chapat or, or fajitas if you're a, a Mexican. You can cook some fajitas. And uh, <laughs> let, let me tell you something. And uh, if you, if like for example, all the you know like all the charcoal they have the fire, they're producing the the heat and everything for you to cook fajitas with. If you picked one charcoal that is right in the middle that has all the fire around it, and then you put it uh, aside for just like 10 or 20 minutes. It will continue to burn and glow for maybe 5 minutes and uh, maybe maybe 2 minutes. But after 10 minutes, uh, you know, the, the glow will continue to disappear little by little. And after like 20 minutes, the fire will go off and even the flies can now come and rest on this uh, on this circle just to have a good time. But 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 once the, the circle is inside the cooking stove and the fire is burning, flies can never dare. Which means, as a Christian, when we stay together in company, when we stay together in a family, we become as strong as lions. And when we stay together as a family, then uh, we can all Life together, grow together as a family, and everyone is on fire for Jesus Christ. But if the enemy can take you out of the family, you think that maybe you don't need the pastor, you don't need the elders, you don't need others, you don't need other families. You can be on fire for a few weeks. <laughs> and you might be on fire for a few months. But trust me, that fire will go off. Because much as God is using you, God is working through you, he is also interested in working in you. And he can use others to work in you. So I finished by saying this. The Antioch Church was a very united church. And I know this church for doing what you've done. You are a very united church. And I want to encourage you, my friends, that uh, all of us who are in this house, support your elders, support your pastor, work together in unison. Because you might be few people, but trust me, what you can accomplish for God as a united family will be greater and bigger than what a 500-member church can do if they are all having strife and contention against each other every, every day. So just walk in that unity and think about that elephant and think about the lion in Kenya that you know, when they come together and they put their, you know, they'll be like, uh, maybe, you know, this is one lion and then they come together. This one will crab, it, crab the, uh, you know, the, the, maybe the giraffe right in the neck and this one will crab the giraffe on the back and this one will crab the legs. And they are pulling this giraffe in every direction. So he might try, try to hit them like this, but because they are together, working together, the young ones and the little ones and the male and the female, they are all on one giraffe. You will discover after a few minutes, bam, and then there will be 1,200 kilos of meat <laughs> for the lion. Amen? So, church, those are the four points. When I was studying the book of, of uh, Acts, I discovered that, uh, that Antioch was a very missions-oriented church, just like this church, and they stay missions-oriented because the heartbeat of God after today is missions.
God wants people to come to Him. And those missionaries that you are supporting, I want to tell you this. They are going to places that maybe you will never go. Our students in Kenya, to be very honest, they have planted churches in places that George, even if they, God gave me the years to live like Medusa, 969, maybe I will not go to those places. There are places that are hard and very dangerous. And you go there, some of our students have churches in Kibira, which is the largest slum in Nairobi. When you go to Kibira in this slum here, of course we know this young, one of my sons has planted a church there, and then church's son has planted a church there. You see the sewage is just flowing over the place, but there, is, there are several million people that live there. Many pastors don't want to go there, but these guys have decided to live there and work there and reach those people. Sometimes when they cook you lunch, you know, the smell in the air, you feel the smell in the air. And uh, if you, you have a problem with seeing stuff, you know, there will be, the sewage will be flowing all over the place. And these guys are there dancing with the Lord because they are interested in bringing these guys to come to Christ. So some of these students have gone to the places where maybe you will never go. And as you support them uh, from this place, I want you to know this, my friend. You are touching God's world and you are making a difference to places that only after you've gone to heaven is when you realize how much influence you had on the world of God. Amen? And as a church, you have to continue to pray, and I'm sure that uh, the God that you serve, as you continue to pray, He's going to use this. I know He's used in a mighty way, but I'm looking at the church because of those four characteristics in this church. I'm looking at the church that will do exports for Christ. And uh, I can't wait to continue hearing the stories about uh, how far this church will take this work. Amen? So thank you so much, guys. I want you to stand up, and I would like to pray a prayer so that we can close this session as we think about uh, this church in Antioch that was so missions-oriented, a church that glided in prayer and fasting, a church that was worship-oriented, a church that was so united. And because of this, they were able to send out the powerful veteran uh, missionaries like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. These guys went all over the world. They planted churches. They preached the gospel and raised the sun. And that uh, the Lord used their lives to bring glory to His holy name. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this afternoon because you are our Father. We thank you because, Lord, you've reminded us that you are on mission on this earth to gather people from every tribe, every nation, and bring them uh, to yourself. And we are so grateful that, Lord, you've called us uh, to join you in this great mission. I pray that, Lord, every place you have planted us and every place that you've sent us we will be find, found to be faithful uh, ambassadors representing you, O oh God, in your character, in your love, and also in your power. I want to thank you for this church, and I thank you, Lord, again for all that they have done to bless the nations of the world. I want to pray for that sister. I want to pray for that father. I want to pray for that young man and that sad lady, oh God. I thank you for their commitment every month to give part of their money to support all these brothers and sisters who are buried all over the world. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless them. May their businesses be blessed. May their careers be blessed. May the work of their hands be blessed. And may the fruit of their womb be blessed, O oh Lord. And we pray that, Lord, continue to give this church the favor. And we pray that, Lord, you continue to bring people who are very missions-minded, people that will support this pastor and these leaders and these elders to fulfill the calling of God on their lives. We want to thank you because, Lord, they will be protected as they go out, and they shall be protected as they come in now and forevermore. We thank you, and we praise you today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.